Well, hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Here we go. We're doing another live stream. Just making sure I can hear myself. Oh, let's see. Do I have my volume down too far? Oh, and Sheila says she's happy for another Monday. Let me see. Can I hear myself? Do you hear me? Oh, there I am. I hear myself. Okay, so I'm assuming you can hear me. <laughs> All right. Yay. Well, happy to have you here for another Monday morning. Um, just a heads up, we won't be here next Monday. I'll give you an early warning. Uh, and then the Monday after that, we're doing a, a GOATS presentation. So with Hillary Hankey from Avian Behavior International. So, um... And uh, those of you who attended the Tower Talk, I, I had a different topic in mind, but, you know, I get off in these different tangents when I start reading stuff. Welcome, Lynn Court Stables. Um, hello. Yeah. I, uh, and I um, some of you may know this really fantastic article by Ogden Lindsley from 1991 that's all about whether we should use plain language or technical jargon. And, um, and so that's kind of what inspired this conversation today. And uh, it's a great article if you haven't read it yet. And, and I will have a link for you for members. Um, it is an open source article. So, um, or so actually I can probably just uh, um, have a download for you uh, for those of you that are members if you want to check it out. But that's the inspiration for our, our conversation today. So for those of you that are new, this is UB the Behavior Consultant, a live stream I try to do most every Monday. Like I said, next Monday, have to take a little uh, a little break. And then the one after that, we will do a global online animal training summit presentation. So those ones are really in depth um, with guest presenters. Um, and how does it work? I present a topic for discussion. Um, this is interactive. We want you to participate. So I've got some questions and things to prompt you to participate and give us your input, your feedback, your experience. We like to have it interactive and then we'll have a nice recap at the end. And what are we talking about today? We're talking about, oh, yay, great. Happy to have you here to chat with us on this topic. Yeah, this one is, I struggle with this one um, as well because I, I like to be precise, but I also want to be accessible. So we're going to talk about plain language versus technical jargon in animal training and um and, uh, and uh, you see my little birds up there, jargon, the twittering and chattering of birds, because that's actually the origin of the word jargon. So I guess it's a, um, my, the stuff that I looked up said it's French in origin, the word jargon, and it really does mean the twittering and chattering of birds. And then if you go down some pathways, it gets even more, um, you can get into words like gobbledygook <laughs> and where that comes from. And, um, and FOG is um, frequent, use, or it's like, frequent use of gobbledygook or full of gobbledygook or something like that. I guess that's another acronym out there, which I think is hilarious. So I might even start using FOG fog when I see lots of gobbledygook. Uh, anyway, so my questions for all of you, um, just to get us chatting here, um, is if you struggle with using plain language or technical jargon, and, um, and I have to say, um, I do, <laughs> uh, uh, and Chris says, oh, oh she, she's a uh, comment to Lincourt Stables. Nice to see some horse folks here um, using positive re reinforcement, especially with the hunters and the jumpers. Yes, our, our hunter jumper, sorry. Um, yeah, I used to ride dressage when I was a, a youngin um, way back when. Uh, um, so, uh, um, of course, th those were different times, I guess, as far as how the training was um well i guess that some of it is still the same um so back to our discussion here uh and uh and people on the leading edge here yes okay so um do we struggle with the use of plain language or technical jargon and then maybe you guys have some thoughts about maybe there's times when you feel it's more appropriate to use one or the other and we can talk about what those situations might be and um have you found ways to make it easier to be understood when when you feel like you're struggling? Mm. Uh, oh, and, and we're talking about how hard it is to get the dressage folks to, to get into with some of maybe the the um, the kind of stuff you're doing. Mm, interesting. Yeah, that would be another a whole. Maybe one day we'll have to do a horse thing. I'm not a I'm not an expert on that stuff. I haven't been in that world in a long time. But you guys could probably provide a lot of uh, interesting discussion on all that I, I think I won one one ribbon a million years ago and I think it was sort of like a um a pat on the head saying you tried <laughs> 
I wasn't all that good at it. I just wanted to go play with horses. <laughs> I just wanted to give horses treats. <laughs> okay, Sheila says, yes, when I first started off as a trainer, I used all the scientific jargon and I noticed my clients were not understanding. So I started using more simple terms or analogies. Now I ask my clients if, and you're writing more, I'll wait for you. I guess uh, YouTube will only let you put in so many words. They limit you. <laughs> Oh, showing up is a win. Thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I just like I just like being around animals. Um, now I ask clients if they want the understanding. Oh, that's that's lovely. Um, I think that's a really great way to put it. Um, if asking the client if they would like um, the fancy the fancier word, so to speak, the scientific jargon. I have a slide in here that I think um, I'll get that'll sort of address that. Uh, because I think that's really important is to, to not, maybe not necessarily remove that option for the client if they want it. I think that's really important because um, I know I have some clients that are really hungry for more of that and who knows where it may lead for some of them. I think a lot of us know that we've had clients that end up being really enthusiastic about animal training and then they go on to become um, really amazing uh you know, they, they get so involved in it, they start becoming, you know, more like professional trainers and go down that pathway once they've gotten a little taste of it, you know. So so you, you start feeding them more and more and more stuff, you know. Yeah. So, um, so that kind of leads into a question, you know, maybe about who some of our, our, our learners are, or maybe some of the audience, maybe who are some of these people that were using um, technical language and maybe plain language with who might some of those people be um those that want more i will explain or i will add research or peer review the documents to their training plan oh i really like that oh you know what so you maybe i should go to this slide because you're really on to something there um I can, okay i think i'm going to go to the slide because you're making such a good point um so providing a plain ex explanation but leaving the door open so this was from a person who, um, I, uh, I'm trying to remember her title now, but she wrote, um, I believe it's a good thing to include technical jargon and documents for the public and other groups who are not familiar with it, so long as it's well explained. And she wrote, there are two reasons for this. From a practical point of view, it's impossible to replace completely most words and phrases that fall into the category of technical jargon with plain English translations that are concise and accurate in meaning. Meaning, but from an ethical point of view, exposing the audience to technical jargon can help them to understand more about the field. This gives them more power. And, she, and I thought this was a really nice um, analogy. Take the analogy of patients going to see their doctor. If they want to have a clear explanation of their diagnosis in layperson's language, but they may well find it useful to have the medical term too, they will then know if their diagnosis is the same as that of someone else they know, but be able to look up more about it in a book or on a website. Feel that the doctor credited them with the interest and intelligence to hear the use um, and use the medical term. I thought that was really cool. So this person who wrote this, she's she was more like the the outsider, so to speak. You know, the lay person when um, writing the article, um, and because uh, she she when I, the rest of the article talks about like sitting in a room having to take notes with all these people that were talking in scientific language, and she was kind of bored and sort of not getting anything but just taking all these notes and um and then she was like nah, well you know but it's it's but then when her child got sick she was like trying to understand everything and she wanted everything and there were words that she didn't understand and sometimes they freaked her out but then she was like but I want to understand what that word means so I thought that was that's kind of going um going along the lines with with what Sheila said um and uh, Lincourt Stable says, I've been introducing the science part gradually. Mm. So um, so who are some of these people that, you know, I think Sheila and Lincourt, you're kind of talking about maybe um, people that are clients that are working with their animals directly. Um, I start them with how fun it is to work with, re with the rewards and then and then add in some education and terminology. Mm, yeah, so get them hooked maybe. <laughs> get them hooked on it so that they're kind of curious yeah 
I always ask my clients, what do they do for a living? Engineers and teachers are my favorite to work with. Oh, because they can probably already relate to at some level, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I have, I've done that before. When somebody says they're a teacher, I go, oh, this is all going to make sense to you. Because <laughs> they, they already have a background, um, you know, working with their, their students. Yeah, so that kind of makes me think about um, our audience. Um, you know, who might be some of these people where you're using your different, um, I guess, language or technical, plain language or technical jargon. So that's something that we might want to think about. So who might be some of the, the people? So I think right now you guys are talking more directly with clients, but what might be some other people that you have to talk about animal training with or communicate with when it comes to animal training? I know I've had some situations where I've been like, ooh, my language here is going to be very, very, very important. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's caused me to pause, you know, and really pick, pick words that were very carefully chosen. What do you guys think about some, some of those audiences? In addition to your clients, I would say, like your direct clients, obviously, like the, you know, you've got the person that's working directly with the animal, but there might be some other people that, that you're communicating with or in, in general, <laughs> in the animal training world. Ah, your avian vet, because she always wants to know my resource. Yep. I think veterinarians are people we need to communicate about animal training for sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Definitely a good one. And then that gets you thinking about terminology, right? And and it can vary, I would imagine, depending on the individual that you're talking with. Any any other audiences that come to mind for some folks? I obviously have a slide, but I want to give you all a chance to think about it. <laughs> yeah, because the audience is, uh, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, having vets on board, on board is sometimes interesting. Sure. Yeah, and, you know, because they have different backgrounds um, with behavior. You know, I've certainly had the experience with, um, you know, some schools uh, backed off on their, on their programs that provide behavior. Um, you know, just financially, it became difficult. And, and then some of the behavior stuff they teach is different. Um, coworkers from different departments at the shelter I work for, absolutely. Um, you know, they may not want the technical jargon. They, it, it, they may be in the same boat as the client where it's not something that they've had exposure, exposure to. Peer to peer, also sometimes it, it's um, challenging. And a group situation like a workshop, which may have people who are mixed in their knowledge, yeah. Yeah, you guys are coming up with some good ones there. Yes, yeah, we have a whole bunch of audiences. So, um, yeah, so we've got, you know, we might think about our professional community where we might have a professional publication. We might be producing guidelines for an industry. There might be trade organizations that are communicating with each other. We've got our conferences. Um, and then we've got, you know, practitioners, you know, folks that are actually out there, you know, doing consulting and talking peer to peer, like you guys were pointing out, doing workshops. Um, so we may have a language amongst ourselves that we can use and we maybe understand between each other where we can be maybe a little bit more technical and, and um, people, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a short, it's almost like a, like a shorthand, you know, cause we, under, we already have used the technical jargon enough that we understand what that means. And then you guys have been talking a lot about clients that, you know, that might be the person that's doing the direct animal caregiving um, or person doing the training. And it can vary, right? Some of those folks may be very, very knowledgeable. Some of them may have a limited background in the behavior science. And then, 
some of you have already talked about different stakeholders like a veterinarian may have a state may have a stake in the in that animal's welfare and some of us that work with facilities it may be a director of the facility there may be curators there may be a board of directors that you know really are very disconnected sort of from the animal industry but they still have a say in what goes on with those animals and then it may be family members um, if you're working if you're somebody who consults with families um, who have a, a pet or that you know that maybe not everybody in the family is directly interacting with that animal but they still have an interest in what's going to be the outcome of that consultation and again you know wide range of backgrounds there and then for um for me you know again as working with facilities we may have people that are talking to the general public about animal training we may have media that comes in that maybe want to do some spot you know some uh, television spot that may have some communication that's going to be going on about the animal training there and again that media person is not going to want to hear technical jargon probably they're going to need some explanation that's going to go out to the public that needs to be in plain language that everybody can understand so there's that's just a handful there that i picked out there but there probably can be some more that you guys can identify if we start thinking about it so we've got a lot of different audiences there with um you know different needs when it comes to how we communicate about our industry so it can really get us thinking and again um, when I think about you know how we talk there might be times in these different communities where it's going to be beneficial to use technical jargon and it might be beneficial to use um, plain language so what do you guys think when you know what what might be some benefits of using technical language i mean we've talked a lot about the plain language um but what might be some benefits of technical language what when would you want somebody to use some technical language or you know and why <laughs> especially when you look at these audiences when might it be helpful i kind of gave a little bit of a um, benefit to it but i think there's some other benefits too any thoughts on that I'll give you guys time to type. <laughs> it's a head scratcher here, huh? <laughs> and you might even think about just times when you've found yourself looking for those words. Um, yeah, differentiation when drilling down on a concept text takes less, less explanation when you, when, when you know the whole meaning of a term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think kind of what you're, you're getting at there, Annette, is that sort of, you know, if you're talking to another, um, person who understands that technology, then you guys don't have to explain it. You can just use that technical jargon, right? You, you just say the word, that person knows it. Um, you know, you, like if you thought about another industry, like, you know, thought about a doctor talking to a doctor during surg surgery, you know, you don't want them to have to go down to plain language. You want that doctor to be able to say, you know, the exact technical jargon to that doctor, right? You want them to be able to go back and forth with their technical jargon and know that the other one is knowing exactly what they're saying. You wouldn't want them to have to take it down to plain language, right? Um, and Annetta says, yes. And um, Rocky Roach says, during educational training, yeah, that might be a good time. Like maybe you're, you're um, teaching some, you know, some of your peers and professionals, like you're trying to bring somebody up to speed with the technical jargon. Maybe how technical terms can be recognized in other parts of life, not just training. Um, yeah, so maybe um, cro across, um, you know, acro across uh, applications, I guess, is what you're, you're going towards there. Yeah, yeah. So that maybe people can recognize something in other situations. Yeah. So I'm going to throw a slide up here. So when I think about it, um, 
I think a really important place for me is when there's no room for error. You know, we really want our precise language. Um, so we might need it in scientific debate. We might want it in legal debate. You know, I talked about the medical procedures, government regulations, legal terms, contracts, binding, um, binding agreements. And so, you know, we do have that kind of stuff in our industry. You know, so we have um, guidelines that we write out. We have maybe um, standard operating procedures. We may have um, ethics, um, ethical guidelines, codes of ethics. These are the kinds of places where I think we want really precise language. And, um, and if we need to explain those terms later on someplace in the document, we can do that. We can write out definitions for people. But I think it's really helpful to make sure that we are precise in our language in those things. We don't want it to be, well, I sort of mean this. We want to be really s specific on that. We might also, you know, think about your um, publications when you're writing, you know, something that's going to be in a journal article. You want it to be precise. And again, we talked uh, about, you know, when when two parties that understand the language are communicating, we can use that 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 as our language to communicate, and it saves time and money basically between those those two parties who can communicate with precision and who understand the terminology. So I think there is a time and a place for it. Um, in our community, and, and there's some places where it's really essential, and, um, and we should really be considering it and using it. <laughs> but as you guys also pointed out, we also want to be understood, and, um, and there's value in that. So there are situations where, you know, if the listener can't follow, they, they may not be engaged. And so we want to make it easy for them to follow, to participate, and implement the information to, um, that we provide. And I think, you know, really, a really classic example going on right now in our community is this whole issue with negative reinforcement. Because, you know, just the word negative reinforcement, you know, that word negative, it just scares people. And it's hard for people to wrap their brains around what that looks like. And... Um, and the process can look very different depending on how the procedure is applied. And so there's lots of misunderstanding about that. And so this leads to like this resistance, you know, automatically without even an opportunity to understand how negative reinforcement could be applied in a, a non-coercive way and how positive reinforcement could be potentially coercive, as, you know, Joe Lang has explained to us many times with the degrees of freedom issue. And so it can lead to resistance of information that can improve animal welfare if it's not explained well. And it's really just a, a matter or a, a matter of uh, plain language stuff, right? Um, let's see some of the comments here. Um, uh, YouTube channel Wired have their interviews called Five Levels that's, um, that show how to communicate a complex subject in different levels of language and complexity. Oh, I'll have to check it out. From kids to experts. All right, cool. Soraya has a, a recommendation here. I'm gonna I'll look at it. Yeah, that's that's cool. Um, that is what I find um, is the second you say the term negative, everyone, including me, tenses up. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, and that's not even a new debate. <laughs> you know, that's an old one that goes way back. Um, you know, it's you know way you know people you know, going way back in behavior analysis, you know, it's that, that whole thing of just the word negative for us just means so many different things in plain English that, you know, being put in there as a scientific term has, has a, causes us to have a reaction, right? And so, I, so you know, this kind of leads us to, well, what are some things that we can do to help make it easier to understand? And so I wonder if you guys have any thoughts ah yes do you have a replacement that's a great question and punishment yeah right and punishment so i think that's a um a great um a great a great uh um proposal do you have a replacement and so those and maybe i'll just go to that slide so what some people have done is they've come up with um acronyms and analogies and so for, for those of you that have been following some of the constructional approach, um, so you've heard, you may have heard of CAT, um, which was uh, the acronym for constructional aggression treatment, which is basically a negative reinforcement procedure 
but the way the procedure is applied is this very, 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 very benign application. And so it's really a negative reinforcement contingency, but the way you do it is just so, so, you know, you set up your environment so that the animal, you know, barely notices the stimulus that in the past, you know, has elicited or, you know, or, um, you know, created a situation where the animal emits an aggressive response. And so, you know, the, the way you do it is, is just so much nicer, right? Um, so, you know, using an acronym. Um, and then I, the one I have above it here is, you know, a human one that I don't know that if people have used it, if it stuck around, but it was um, SIP, Sincere, Specific, Immediate, Personal. And this acronym lists the features used to select and deliver social reinforcers. It's important that praise be sincere um, and said sincerely. Praise must also be specific. You tell the person exactly what they did that you are reinforcing. And this is from the Lindsley article that I'm, I am, um, you know, most of this presentation is, you know, based on. Um, and then analogies, you guys are going to relate to this one. You guys have absolutely heard about the compliment sandwich, right? Um, where punishment sandwich between two reinforcers, where some pe management programs told people to mix reinforcement and punishment this way. And then, of course, it was found that this should be avoided. It makes people suspicious. It sets up reinforcement as an antecedent for punishment, making reinforcement less credible at other times. And so in animal training, we've, uh, well, actually, Karen Pryor kind of coined the term, described this as something similar, and it was called the poison cue, right? And so that's why I have this very unhappy looking dog here. So maybe a leash, instead of going for a walk, is now paired with something aversive. And so it's it's sort of this mixed signal, right? Oh, no, did the audio go, do go away? I can make it louder. Uh, I can do this. I can make it, I can raise it up a little bit, see if that helps. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so, so we can come up with analogies. You hear it? Okay. Um, we can come up with analogies. We can come up with acronyms. Um, I tried to turn it up. I don't know if that helped. <laughs> um, we can come up with analogies. We can come up with acronyms. Yes, much better. Okay, good. Um, and, uh, and some of those can kind of help communicate some things without having to get really complicated. So like if you think about... Um, and then you just kind of have to remember the word. So like with the poison cue, if you sort of remember, you know, you're mixing reinforcement and, and punishment together or, or, or negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement together in, a, in an aversive way or in, a, in an inappropriate way um, or constructional or, or cat is, um, is a negative reinforcement procedure to um, address aggressive behavior, um, that, that can be a, a, a nicer way of, saying those things um and then another one and you guys can be thinking about maybe think about some other ones that you may know uh another thing that you can uh think about is application tests and so here's ogden lindsley looking very handsome there i thought i thought gosh he was he was a good looking guy back there um is the dead man's test. You guys may have heard this one before. And so when we talk about an application test, this is more like um, a phrase that that basically tells you to try, you know, try this, try this out and as a as a thing to give you information. So this was that if a dead man can do it, it isn't behavior and shouldn't be taught. Um, and, uh, and then I, I threw this in here as my own little, well, what about, you know, I made up a test. How's that? We'll put it that way. Because one of the things that I'm finding in, in my own work and then with some of my clients is that we often miss, we often miss when negative reinforcement in that benign, a negative reinforcement contingency is happening and that we should be considering using negative reinforcement procedures in a benign application. So if we see an animal that basically wants distance as a reinforcer, I think there's this tendency for us to try and, you know, well, let's give it food and, you know, and coax it over and coax it to sort of tolerate that aversive stimulus because that's what a lot of us were taught. I was taught that. I, I did teach that for a long time. But now that I've learned to notice these um, 
uh, animals showing this, I don't want to interact with that, or maybe they're showing aggressive behavior to try and get you to go away. Now that I'm starting to recognize this more, I'm doing a little better of a job myself at saying, you know what, I'm going to give that animal space. I'm going to use that negative reinforcement contingency. And um, after the animal has learned that, oh, I will give it space, um, then I start seeing an animal that's showing me lots of calm and nice, relaxed behavior. And then I can switch to a positive reinforcement um, contingency. So this is that constructional approach that we've talked about before, looking at the nonlinear analysis and how I can transition to positive reinforcement after I've started with that negative reinforcement contingency. So I'm just going to call it, you know, a no thank you, I need space test. And so the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to basically, you know, if, if um, you know, let's say I'm, I'm the I'm approaching the animal and the animal goes oh I'm moving away from you that's the animal going no thank you I need space so that tells me I need to use a negative reinforcement contingency first meaning that you know if I approach and the animal walks away then I'm going to try to start much 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 farther away approach a tiny little bit if the animal stayed calm I'm going to move I'm going to remove myself and I'm going to um, try to approach again, the animal stayed calm, I'm going to remove myself. I'm going to try to approach again a little bit closer, the animal stayed calm, I'm going to remove myself. That's all negative reinforcement. And eventually I'll get to a place where I'm close enough that then I can transition to positive reinforcement. I, it could also be an aggressive response. The animal could move towards me in, in, with body language that says, I don't like you. And if I see that, that gives me information that, I, again, that's also a no thank you, I need space then maybe I'm going to use negative reinforcement, but in a different way where I'm going to start farther away and instead I'm going to be looking for calm behavior again, but but different body language, right? So, um, but the same, it's the same procedure, but it's just a negative reinforcement thing. So, so again, I'm going to try to be more attentive to when does the animal need space and that's going to tell me that I'm going to need to use a negative reinforcement contingency or procedure, a benign application of it first, and then I get to transition to positive reinforcement after we've worked through that negative reinforcement contingency. So, um, so that, you know, I don't know, I'm, I might use that with my clients. We'll see. <laughs> I know. Thank you. I need space tests. <laughs> my new made up thing, my new, my new made up application test. We'll see if it sticks or not. Um, so, um, yes. Okay. Now let's look at, um, some others that, yeah, and again, if you guys think of any ones that you, you know, have used, you know, is there anything, any acronyms or analogies that you've used to help your clients understand something without having to go into technical jargon? That would be great to know. Let's, let's uh, throw them in there. Anything that you've tried with your clients. Um, you may recall we did a live stream on catchphrases. Um, but again, these technically could fall under our um, analogies or application tests, um, right? So we talked about the rat is always right, Pavlov is, is always on your shoulder, behavior goes where, where the reinforcement flows, you get what you reinforce. Do you remember talking about all of those? But we just, we just called them catchphrases in that particular live stream. And here's another one that was in that um, article. Um, Behavior you take with you, accomplishment you leave behind. And, um, and this was a quote that was credited to Tom Gilbert, another very famous behavior am analyst. Um, and Lindsay, Lindsley was saying that if only Skinner had used something like this, instead of struggling with terms like functional definitions or confusing, confusing things with statements like, you can measure behavior or the results of behavior. And, and so the way that they describe this in the article is, is like instead of um, looking at the results versus looking at the behavior. Um, and so that, that was the way that uh, they sort of used, were using that phrase. But it's interesting in that, you know, that, that phrase hasn't really stuck with us. And, and that kind of brought me to... Um, one of the things that we talked about in, uh, in our catchphrase thing, because as we were talking about our different catchphrases, there were some that didn't really work for us. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that, that some really didn't stand the test of time. <laughs> and, 
And some of them that were being used right now, we kind of were like, ooh, those aren't really accurate. Um, and I think this is in part because, um, you know, you know, part because our culture moves on, part because science progresses. And, um, and so I think we would have to say that, you know, some of these are going to drop, um, you know, drop out and some of them are going to stick around. So I would say that not all of our acronyms or analogies or, or analogies and tests will be here in the long term. Um, let's see. No one eats um, a file at a, a gun at, um, file at a gun, a file at a gun site and why adding more food won't work. Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> no one eats a filet. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sir. No one eats a filet of beef as why adding more food won't work. <laughs> Soraya, you're going to have to help me here. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. Oh, no one eats a fillet of beef at the like when they're staring at um staring at a gun. That's is that what you're saying? No one will eat a fillet of beef when like they're having to stare at a gun. So that's why eating more food won't work. Right? Yeah, yeah. So if you're super super scared, and you're and someone's just throwing food at you. It doesn't mean that you're going to, yeah, okay, good. I got it. Yay. <laughs> no, you're okay. I, I think it was just the, the typos that had me confused there. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a really good way of putting the whole, um, uh, the counter conditioning um, uh, thing into perspective. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of us trainers are still struggling with the confusion with that with the whole counter conditioning thing because of what we were taught I was certainly taught that as well that you know if we just add good things the animal will overcome the fear but you're right you know when we're really afraid just giving me more food isn't going to help me overcome the fear what would help me overcome the fear is for the gun to go away <laughs> So I think you're really addressing what's really the important thing there. So, um, so if we can, uh, we can make that um, gun go away, that would be much more helpful. Yeah, that's a good point. I could never understand the dead, dead man's catchphrase, like, like isn't station, stationing quietly a behavior? You know, I, I thank you for saying that, um, Chris. I, I have to agree. Um, let me put that back up here. Where is it? Application test. It is a weird phrase for me too. If a dead man can do it, it isn't behavior and it shouldn't be taught. It is a weird one to think, to think through. I have, I, I've always thought that as well. Um, yeah, it's sort of like backwards. It's like a backwards way of thinking something. I think cause it's a, it's like a double negative or, you know, or yeah. Isn't that how you would say it? <laughs> I, I agree with you. I found that I've always found that one a little bit odd to think about. Um, but I guess I don't, I, I guess I, I you know, because, because I guess it's addressing the thing that po most people say, I want the animal to stop doing this. Um, and I want the animal to stop doing that and stop doing that. Um, maybe being frozen and not breathing. But I think that's, I think that's the way that most people are thinking is they want animals to stop doing stuff instead of to do stuff and so I think that's sort of the direction that that's trying to address so um so I tend and you know and that's I think maybe where people are going there yeah Sarai says I don't get I don't get it maybe being frozen and not breathing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um but I think it's to help people get away from you know the stop the stop doing stuff and focus on the what do you want the animal to do instead of the not do. Yeah, um, that, I think that's the idea. Um, I see what you mean. I don't want the horse to paw. <laughs> yeah. Um, and trying to stop all possible behavior except the desired behavior. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, you know, how, how most people try to use use that um, that phrase. And or that's the challenge that people were getting into is I don't want him to do this instead of, well, what do you want him to do? Um, yeah, let's see. I got it. Yeah. But, um, I like those, uh, thoughts you guys were having there. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, so kind of the, the gist of that article, I should go back here. 
because it is um, it is his article. It's Ogden Lindsay's article that um, is really the one about the jargon versus sim uh, plain language. And it is it is a well known article. It's a pretty famous article that talks about you know how do we um, you know kind of help make it easier for people to understand. And there, it's really interesting. There's a chart in there um, with sort of you know, the scientific terminology, sort of a middle and then kind of plain language. And what's really interesting um, is there's a lot of use of the word reward in the article. And and what's really interesting is I don't I I don't like to use the word reward, um, uh, but there is a lot of that use of the word reward in the article. So that's one thing that I think is sort of um, kind of did get used and then kind of faded away again in animal training. Um, I think, I, I mean, I think, you know, people do, do still use the word, but I feel like we've kind of gotten away from using the reward word um, a bit more lately. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, um, I, I don't like the word reward, I guess, because I don't know, there's some things about it for me that, yeah, that, I mean, I, yeah, it's a good question. Why not reward? Um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, it, for me, it, it feels limiting. <laughs> reward is understandable to the general public, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, for me, I, I feel like it's limiting. And I guess I, I guess I, I tend to move away from it. Um, Equine culture has problems with food as rewards. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I've 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 heard that before, um, and maybe sometimes do people do they automatically assume that when you say reward it means food, or do they are they willing or do they kind of see it as more than food? I like using paycheck because clients understand if they, they do not get paid for they, their work they would stop working. Lots of problem with hand feeding. Yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting, well, of course, this is sort of like trainer talk now, <laughs> um, the paycheck thing, because, you know, um, that's a, that's that degrees of freedom thing. I have, cause I just had an interesting conversation with somebody about this the other day, because we find that, you know, that even a paycheck cannot keep somebody at a job. There's so many other things that will make a job reinforcing, oh. um, Oh, and Edda says, I say that reward is referring to what has already happened while reinforcer is referring to what we wish to see in the future. Hmm, interesting. Um, what do you say instead? I stopped using click treat moving to mark, to mark reward. Um, yeah, and, and like treat is limiting too, right? Because treat only sounds like food. And obviously we have other things. And maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe it's because for me, I like... I guess, yeah, I guess, I, yeah, I mean, I tend to say reinforcer or appetitive. I like, it, well, reinforcer is if it's increasing, uh, that's, I, okay, thank you guys. This is talk out loud problem solving. Um, I think I like to say the word appetitive now because appetitive is something, it's more open. Appetitive is, can be anything the animal likes and reinforcer means it's increased behavior right and maybe this is me this is good good thank you guys for getting me talking here um and uh and so if i'm if i'm trying to be precise in my language and also for my own understanding um if i i think a lot of people can understand appetitive i think that is a yeah okay appetitive you know because we think appetite appetite's a word that a lot of people understand appetitive it is sort of, you know, people kind of get that word, appetitive, something I like, yep, as desirable. And when you say appetitive, it's not so far for people to understand. And appetitive can be anything somebody likes. So it's, it, can be, it can be a food item, it can be a scratch, it can be wanting to go outside, it can be, pl you know, playing with something, it can be getting a hug, it can be, you know, watching your favorite TV program. So appetitive can be anything an organism desires or wants access to or wants to do. Um, and, um, and then in terms of whether it's gonna reinforce behavior or not, we won't know that until 
after, right? After we see what happens. So, um, so I think I, I'm now, I've gravitated more towards that because I know, you know, and then it makes me happy because I feel like it's a little bit more understandable and it's also precise. So it kind of makes me happy on both sides. <laughs> um, and Annette is asking how many people will understand. Um, I, I don't know, I feel like it's one that people could understand, but I guess, you know, the, the time will tell, right? So you guys can test it out. <laughs> Um, I mean, I've been using it, but, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, it makes sense to me and it, and I think it would make sense to clients, but we'll find out, I guess. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I know I've certainly used it in some of our documents we've worked on. Um, and again, uh, um, you know, you, yeah, I know you guys can test it. You'll have to let me know, try it out with your clients. Let me know if they, uh, if they, if they'll, if they get it or not. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, what else um, about that? Yeah, and then in terms of, you know, like we said, reinforcer, we don't know if it's a reinforcer yet or not until we see how, you know, what happens with the behavior, whether the behavior increases or not. So, um, so uh, yeah. And then, again, of course, appetitive would be, yeah. Okay, there, yeah, I think I, did, I, I explained as, as much as I can on that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, good. So that that was a that was a good question, you guys. Thank you for asking that. You helped me you helped me ex, you know, get my thoughts out on on why uh why I've moved away from the word reward. <laughs> I I couldn't find it in my head there. Um nice word appetitive in my lang in my language it's associated with food. Yummy desirable opens up to other types of reinforce, re reinforcers. Sometimes I go to it is something the horse would seek with clients. Okay. Yeah. And, and to me, that sort of works with appetitive, you know, um, you know, appetitive, anything the, the horse would, 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 um, desire ac would like access to, would, you know, engage with, um, yes, yes to Soraya. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it could be an activity you know, that I think that's the nice thing with the, with the word appetitive is that it opens the, for me, it opens the door up to everything not just food, it could be, you know, attention, activities, um, sounds, smells, all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, because if I say desired item, then I feel like I have to say desired activity, desired sense, desired everything, you know, but when I say appetitive, it's like everything falls into that, you know, it, I don't have to list, list everything, <laughs> if that makes sense. And that reward thing make to me kind of falls into the, um, you know, kind of after the behavior occurred thing, and then the question of did it did it increase behavior or not comes into play, yeah. As they seek run away of a, of an aversive um, also works, yeah. So um, aversive, I still stick with sort of aversive stimulus, I guess, as I sort of still still stick with those words for for aversive. I mean, people seem to understand aversive. That one still works. Mm. <laughs> that, that word still works for people. Um, uh, uh, I saw, did he want survive or thrive as a, sim as a simplification? Mm. Oh, okay, for, for maybe a, um, a simplification for language. Um, the word, what they seek, desirable. Um, Oh, she's uh, asking, I guess, maybe. Um, okay. Yeah, so lots of lots of ways to bring our, try to, yeah, it, it's, it's, it does take some uh, thinking, though, doesn't it, to try, you know, again, you know, as we're trying to find these ways to simplify stuff. And I will say this article um, gives suggestions on how to try to find um, words that are going to work for you. Like it, it, it basically, you know, suggests doing kind of what you're doing here is writing these out and, um, and kind of finding the one that you think is going to stick, um, and, and trying them out with your clients, you know, and seeing, you know, what, what makes sense, um, to, to them as well. So, you know, nobody says you have to do it, you know, or have to use the word that I'm using or su suggesting, suggesting, you know, there's, um, um, so, like I said, I'll make this uh, article um, available since it was a open source one. Um, 
on the in the membership program so you guys can read more about it and and how to how to kind of find the words that work for you and make it easier to communicate although you may already have them <laughs> like you said you've been practicing already all right so let's see here maybe i'll recap this a little bit um okay so the word jargon comes from the old french word meaning the twittering and chattering of birds it came into english in the 14th century when its meaning was extended to include meaningless talk or gibberish um, despite this, there are some pretty significant situations in which technical words are very important, and most of us would likely want those precise words in use in those situations to protect us and the animals with which we work. However, it's also critical we are understood. Plain language can help make that possible for situations in which all parties are not using technical jargon to communicate. There are also some strategies that can help kind of quote translate jargon into plain language. Uh, we, let's see, um, we can use acronyms, analogies, catchphrases, and tests. Be prepared for these to evolve or be dropped from the lexicon as technology progresses. Keeping one foot in the door with technology reminds us that animal training is rooted in behavior science and is a legitimate evidence-based field. Looking for ways to facilitate understanding with plain language can help us move forward with dissemination, application, and ultimately improving animal welfare. Um, let's see, Annette says, I think it becomes more difficult when you teach English to people who don't have English as their first language. Tricky. Yeah, that's true, too. So you have, um, you have the translation part, too. Oh, goodness. Yeah, lots to think about here. Uh, all right. Uh, so I just want to give you guys a heads up for next week. Um, I... Fingers crossed, I will be um, attending my hearing. So I will not have a live stream next week. Um, and that, that will also mean no tower talk next week because we would normally have a tower talk. Um, and then also early heads up, the week after that will be our tower talk with Hillary Hankey on how wonderful I was wrong. So that's only two weeks away. So I'm just giving you a heads up for that for those of you that want to attend that. And then, um, again, sort of a, an early heads up, anybody in the Boston area, Boston, Massachusetts, if you want to go to the annual Applied Behavior Analysis International Conference, I'll be speaking at that. I'm very excited to be there. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, more about the constructional approach uh, and basically how it has really helped me with some difficult situations, some difficult cases. And so this one's going to be more of an overview of how the the sort of different elements of the constructional approach, um, you know, about nonlinear analysis, about uh, uh, about um, or nonlinear contingency analysis, it's going to be about behavioral freedom, going to be about, um, gosh, I've, I've, I've broken it down into so many different uh, categories and how I use that now when I look at um, animal training and and how to improve animal welfare using a constructional approach. So yeah, so that, you know, it's a group of us. There's, I think there's like 25 of us doing a whole bunch of different series of lectures on constructional analysis or um, constructional approach. So yeah, so Sheila, if you're, you're in Boston, come on out <laughs> or nearby. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. We've all kind of coordinated. So all of our presentations sort of support um, how, how, const how the constructional approach can be used in a whole bunch of different areas. So it's pretty cool. And then um, again, the Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training Conference is after that in July. And then this presentation is very, very specific on, on the procedure and how to apply it with groups of animals, with hoof stock in particular. And so this is a very detailed presentation on, um, on, on some steps and how to do it with groups of animals. And that's one, that one's online. So if you go to um, the um, cout.com website, you'll see more information on that. And then just a reminder for anyone who's not a member of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, you get access to all sorts of cool stuff. If you just go to AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, you can uh, join, join us all there for all sorts of cool things. All right. Oh, there I am. Big in your face. Um, all right, guys. So, um, so I don't get to see you for a couple weeks. I mean, obviously at the goats thing, I'll be there to introduce Hillary and, and uh, talk to you a little bit there. But it's mostly Hillary uh, on that one. So that'll be a really good one um, with her. And uh, yeah, so 
All right. Um, and again, I'll make I'll, I'll get I'll hopefully get all this up, if not today, tomorrow, for those of you that are members with the links to all the resources. I have quite a few resources for you on this topic today. And um, I'm looking at my, yeah. Um, yeah, there's links, links to quite a few resources and also, um, and then I'll have the article um, for you as well if you wanna read some more. Yeah, cool. Oh, and Kathleen Morgan's here too, woohoo. All right, yes, and Hillary's talk um, will be really good too. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too though. Thank, uh, how wonderful I was wrong. We can learn from our mistakes, which, good Lord. Yeah, I've got plenty of those. <laughs> All right, guys, so um, I will look forward to seeing you uh, not next week, but the week after. And I appreciate you all being here and helping me talk some things out loud uh, that, that helped me um, put into words some things that I was having a hard time putting words in, uh, putting words to. But that's always helpful. That's a good practice to do, right? you got a, and a whole other thing to learn about there. Uh, <laughs> but that's a, a talk for another time. Okay, guys. Well, we're a little early, but not too bad. Um, again, uh, thank you for being here, and I look forward to catching up with you next time. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the safe travels. I appreciate it. Wish me, send me all your, your positive vibes. I'm going to need it. <laughs> all right. Oh, good. Thank you. An interesting live stream as always. Okay. Well, I like, I love hearing that. I keep trying. We'll hopefully have some more good stuff for you down the road. Okay, guys, take care, and I look forward to touching base with you again soon. All right. Bye, everybody.